If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 13? It's funny, y'all. Everybody checking their phone right now to make sure it's on silent because you don't want me to call you out like I just did Momo. I get it. Matthew chapter 13, and we're starting in verse, and we're ending in verse 44. We got one verse today. Don't think you're getting lunch early, though. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. And if I had a title for today's message, it would be Step Into the Field. Matthew chapter 14, uh, 13, verse 44. And I don't do this often because there's one verse. I can play this game with you today. I want you to jump to your feet for the reading of the reverence of God's word. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. If we had a title, step into the field. For the kingdom of heaven, the Bible says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. Man, I wish I'd find that field to find treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man found, discovered, hidden in a field in his excitement. And I never understood this part. He hid it again. If it were me, I would have grabbed that treasure and ran with it. I would have stolen it. How do you know he didn't own the field? Because in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. That means he was in a place he wasn't supposed to be because he didn't own it. And he found something there that he wanted. So he hid it again and he sold everything he had so he could go buy that field. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you, dear Lord, for this day. I thank you for the humbling opportunity to bring your message to your people today. Father God, as always, I do not believe in divine, I do believe in divine intervention that you brought them here today. I do not believe that they accidentally or just coincidentally showed up to hear this message. Father God, I'm asking dear Lord that you will begin to go into the recesses of your people's heart. Father God, I'm asking that you will begin to go ahead and fix some of the decay that may be in their heart. Father God, I'm asking that you will go in and begin to heal some of the hurt that is in their heart. Father God, I'm asking that before we leave here today, we will get up enough courage to step into the field with confidence that you have brought us on the edge of. Father God, I am asking, dear Lord, that you take over the service in a way like you've never taken it over before. Father God, hide me behind the only cross that I will ever bow down to, the cross of Calvary. Father God, hide me behind that cross. Father God, anoint my lips from on high, dear Lord, not my opinions, my thoughts, nor my actions shine through today, but let everything I say and do here today be in direct correlation to your word. Father, do not let us deviate to the left nor to the right from your word, but let us walk wholly in the path that you have provided us to walk in. Father, for the path is narrow, dear God, that we must walk. So, Father, let us all grab hold of each other and let us walk down that narrow path for the narrow path, dear God, leads to victory. And, Father, I want your people to experience some victory in their lives. Father God, we are asking for your presence to be real today, strong today. Let us laugh in you. Let us cry in you. Let us rejoice in you. Let us even say a few amens in you. Let us just be completely consumed by your almighty presence. Oh, yeah. Hide us, dear God. God. God, silence our hearts from the world. Father God, whatever happened this week, let us not think about it for a little while here. Father God, just conform and transform our mind to yours. In Jesus' precious, precious name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, step into the field. And I'm going to be honest with you from this passage of Scripture. I draw a lot of assumptions. A lot of them. I, I, I paint a really, a really good picture here. And some of you, you're going to walk out of here. And you're going to start talking about me at lunch today. You're going to be like, you know what? I really don't see that verse the way he saw it. And that is quite okay. You don't have to see it like I see it. I think I'm right. But no, I'm just, you don't have to see it like me. You can disagree with me. 100% I'm okay. Okay. But I, I want to paint a picture probably in this verse. Maybe like you've never heard it before. Here's what I see. I see a wanderer. I see that individual in life right now that is always searching for something. And to be honest, the chances are they don't even know what they're searching for. I see that person who, who is not content in anything. Rachel, don't you look at me. <laughs> I, see, I see that person who is not content in their job, 
They're not content in their parenthood. They're not content in their church. They're not content at the grocery store. They're not content in their car. They're not content on summer vacation when everybody's content. You know how they are. You ask them how they're doing, and boy, you wish you would have asked that question when they start to unload on you. Amen. 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 <laughs> there are some people that no matter what, they are simply just not content in life. We all struggle with that. We can point our fingers at one another. We all struggle with the contentment. And, and I can see this, this man who has walked up to the edge of this field, and uh, he's probably questioning his purpose in life. He's, he's questioning whether or not he has a calling in life. He's questioning whether or not that God is going to give him a purpose or a calling. He, he's probably at that point in life where he just looks up to God and says, you know, life is okay. It's just like mundane. I don't have a lot of excitement or passion, but God, I guess this is just what you want from me. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, but it will be okay. And then all of a sudden, some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, you're talking about that non-church person. Huh? I'm talking about all y'all church people. Because some of the most discontent people are Christians. That guy didn't get one amen on that one. I thought I would have got one. Amen. We're, amen. There, you're two for two, brother. So we're, we're hard. We're, we're hard to be. It's hard to make us content. Because we know we got this God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and we know that he has mansionable mansion. And when you know that your daddy's got anything and everything that you need, just like your kids, you keep asking for anything and everything that you think you need, but most of the time it's just what you want, and you really don't need it. And he has to tell you no sometimes, so you just get discontent with him because he isn't spoiling you like you think he should. Hey, there's this man named Paul. You all know Paul wrote in the Bible? He, he wrote Philippians 4.11, and this is what Paul wrote. He said, not that I was ever in need. said, no one ever but Paul. Not that I was ever in need. For I have learned. See, if you learn something, that, that's what you know. If you learn something, that means somebody had to teach it. Or you had to learn it the hard way on your own. So Paul said, not that I was ever in need, but I have learned. Not that it came natural, because it surely didn't. But I was taught a few life lessons that in all things, Paul said, wherever I am, whatever I have, whatever type of lemons life has served me, I have learned how to be content. And you would probably think Paul was writing this from a glamorous mansion on the hilltop somewhere with his feet propped up sipping an iced tea on a, a nice summer day with a nice cool breeze going through his window. Huh? Paul was chained in prison when he wrote that verse. He was sitting in chains and he wrote a letter to his friends and said, in all things I have learned to be content. I don't deserve to be in prison, but I'm in here because I'm preaching the gospel of Christ. I've learned to be content. The meals here, they ain't first class, but I've learned to be content. The pillow is not the perfect pillow, but I've learned to be content. And once in a while, my back does hurt on these concrete floors, but I've learned to be content. That's hard to say when you feel like you're chained in prison in your own life to look up to God or look at your neighbor when they ask you, hey, how are you doing? Well, I've learned to be content no matter what I have. That's tough. But see, what I've learned is as Christians, so often we are more content with the chains of sin than we are in some just life conditions that we think are unfair. It's amazing how often we'll allow the chains of sin just to remain in our life, and we won't say a word about that, but when we think God has been unfair to us, we shout it on the rooftop. We shout it from the mountaintop. We want him to make sure that we know that we're unhappy with him like he really cares. God, God does care about me. Yeah, he does. He doesn't care about your complaining. The same way you don't care about your kids complaining. They still got to take out the trash when you ask them to. Yeah, they don't. They just say, no, they go play their, yeah, I get you. Amen. Amen. Beat their butt. No, I better not say that. But Paul, Paul, Paul was, it didn't, it doesn't take much for us Christians, and I'm talking to myself here, I'm preaching to the preacher, it doesn't take much to knock all us off our church rocker. Let the music be too loud. Let the preacher be too, talking about loudness. This is a funny story. At work on Monday last week when I walked in, 
Because for some reason, like, you know, people are gossiping about me because they find out I'm a preacher. And when they find out you're a preacher, they don't say the same things around you that they used to. Yeah. It's all cool. It's all cool when they just thought I was Joel who worked with them. But now that I'm Joel who preaches, you know, when I walk by, everybody gets silent. Like, all of a sudden, I'm holier than I was two weeks ago. And so I walk in, and this lady said, she said, I listened to your sermon on Sunday. And she said a word that I'm not going to, to say again. She said, you're loud. I said, you should experience it in real life then and see how loud I am. And, and so, it, talk about loudness. It, it was so funny. Anyway, okay, back to this. And so it doesn't take much for us to get knocked off our rocker, does it? Let us get a flat tire on the way to a job interview that you really, really, let us get a flat tire on the way to the Little League field and your kids are screaming in the back. And we lose all sense of religion. It doesn't even take a flat tire unless you just have to sit in the line at Dunkin' Donuts in Hedgesville because they got to get their service better because that line is always out to the main road. Amen. Just let us sit in there for 25 minutes to get just one donut and a cup of coffee. And we're ready to cuss when we get to the window. Doesn't take much to make us not content. And then you get your coffee, and it's not hot enough, or it's too hot, or they didn't put enough sugar in it, and they left the cream out, and they got your water wrong, they should have given you three cents back, and they didn't. They give you no napkins. No napkins, <laughs> never, not there. I'm boycotting all Dunkin' Donuts, but that's right, I'm boycotting that one, and the next Dunkin' Donut is just as busy. They're doing something right. Anyway, I, I see this man. I see this man head to the edge of this field, and he is so discontent in life. He, he's just unhappy. And nothing bad has really happened to him. Well, you know, on the outside, superficially, probably people look at his life. He's got a nice truck. He's got a good-looking car. He's got a good-looking wife. He's got two dogs. He's, he's got it made. And he walks on the edge of the field. And he doesn't know how he really got there. He doesn't know why he's there. In fact, my mind starts going crazy when I ask the question, well, I wonder why he was there. I wonder if he was walking his dog or he was trying to chase his dog. I, I wonder if he was, like, chasing after a woman because he wasn't married and he wanted a date? Or I wonder if he was running from a woman because he was married and he didn't want to go on a date. I wonder, I wonder if he just needed, come on, you parents will say amen to this, especially you ones that have little kids. I wonder, and you might not even have little kids just if you're married. I wonder if he just had to get out of the house because his spouse and his kids were just driving him crazy. Amen. And he gets to the edge of the field. I wonder if he was texting as he went. And you know when you walk and you text, you look up and you're like, how in the world did I get here? And I wonder if he was texting while he was walking to the edge of the field because his wife wouldn't give him just a little bit of downtime and so he built a shed so he could get away from her. I wonder if he... I'm kidding. He didn't build a shed. That's not in the Bible. I don't know where those minds are going. And so he was texting as he was walking and he looks up He's like, I, I don't know where I'm at. I have no idea. I don't know how I got here. I'm looking at this open, barren field. I don't know if I should go left. I don't know if I should go right. I surely can't turn around because I don't know how to get back home. I don't know if y'all have ever been lost in the woods. This boy has been lost in the woods before, and it's scary. Once the sun came up, I realized I wasn't lost in the woods. But at night, in the woods, sometimes you feel like you're lost. And I wonder, he got to, I wonder if he saw all you hunters out there. I wonder if he saw like the no hunting posted sign on the trees at the edge of the field and he was a little worried. Listen, when I was younger, I'm telling stories today. When I was younger, in college days, there was this man named Ward Rudy. He used to take me turkey hunting. And you know what? Those posted signs, they applied to everybody except the two of us. <laughs> I never understood that. Like, it would have the owner's name. I'd be like, Ward, do you know who owns this? No, don't worry about that. They don't apply to us. <laughs> and there have been a few times that we ran into people behind the other side of those poster signs, and lo and behold, they did apply to us. And they told us to turn around and come back where we came from. Remember that, Ward? Yeah, you do. If you don't, it's a selective memory. We got chased out of more than one field. And... I don't know, so I don't, I don't know why he's traveling. I don't know the purpose of his trip. I don't know where he intended to go, but he ends up on this field, and I'm assuming that he looks across the field, and it is quite barren. He doesn't know whether to go right, whether to go left, and he surely can't go back home because he's lost. And I don't know about you, but I can relate to this man. I, I fight not being content in all things. I, I fight not understanding the purpose of life sometimes. I, I fight not understanding the calling. I, I still wander at times. 
and I get to the edge of fields, and, and I, I get there, and I'm not sure where I am in life, and I, I ask God, did I take a wrong turn? Did I do something wrong? Am I on my own? And there, there are occasions that I have taken the wrong turn on myself, and it's not God's fault or Him's leading. I, I just, it was my own fault. But there are other times as I, I get to the edge of the field, and I can't really know what I've done wrong to get there, but I know I'm not really where I want to be or should be, and I'm just discontent in these things. And I'm looking across this barren territory, and I'm asking God, why in the world did you bring me here? And I try to go back to the Bible verse that says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by God, and I'm looking at him, and I'm asking him the question, if you order my steps, why in the world did you order me down this trail that led to this open field? Well, why, why is it in my Why? I'm just not happy. And so here's this man now. He's on the edge of the field. He's unhappy with life. Things just aren't, it just isn't what it should be. And very quickly today, the next 13 minutes, I'm going to teach you three things about barren fields. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because I would say this sermon applies to 100% of us today. I know some sermons you can't relate to. If you can't relate to this one today, you're just not trying. Three things that barren fields can teach us. Number one, I'm gonna get excited today. Number one, barren fields bring abundant Amen. life. Amen. Barren fields bring abundant life. Listen, the treasures of God are found in some of the least expecting places. Amen. Now listen, when Jesus rose from the dead, the women got to the tomb and the angels said, why in the world are you searching for Jesus here? He's not here. But that's how we are, us church people. It seems that we search for God in all the wrong places. When you get to the edge of a barren field and you don't think it looks like God or smells like God or acts like God, he is saying that you've got to have a spirit within you to search. And no matter what stage or phase of life you're in, everybody has searched in your life. You search for a job. And some of y'all still searching. You like the one you have. You search for a man. Some of y'all still searching because you don't like the one you have. You all search for a woman. And you're just lucky you found one. You search for joy. You search for happiness. You search for something to satisfy the hunger that life seems to bring you. We search and we search and we search and we search and we search. And I believe the searching soul is instilled within us the moment we take our first breath. So why, why does God cause us to search? Why, why did he put... Listen, I, I know some people, you may not even believe in God if you're here today. That, that's okay. I'm going to preach to you anyway. Because here's the thing. For someone to say they don't believe in a God, why in the world would there be an emptiness in a human being? There's always an emptiness. There is always something missing in our life until you find the treasure that's buried in a barren field. It's always there. There's a hole. No matter how many toys you have, no matter how many girlfriends you have, no matter how many friends on social media you have, there's always a hole until you find a treasure that fills it. Amen. And it's the very thing that verifies the fact that we've got a God. And see, what the enemy tries to do is he takes advantage of the searching soul that you are born with. The Bible says that if you search for me, you shall find me. So God has to instill a searching spirit within you because if he doesn't, you'll never find him. But the enemy knows that God has instilled this searching spirit. And so he puts all this glamour in front of us. Things that look good, things that smell good, things that are precious or they look beautiful. And he tries to draw us to things that look like they will satisfy the hunger that we have within us. But how many times... Have you got there and the thing that you thought would satisfy the hunger or quench the thirst, it was simply a mirage or you got involved in something that actually caused you to hunger more or thirst more. See, that's what the world does. The, the world gives us things that have a look of godliness. They act like godliness, but they're not filling the void like that which is godly should do. They're just wrapping chains around us that eventually we have to break because if we're not breaking those chains, we never can get rid of the searching spirit. Listen, sometimes the barren field that God gets you to the edge of and he's asking you to walk through and to step into, I don't want you to get discouraged by it. Right now in your life, if you feel like you're on the edge of a barren field, I know we don't willingly stroll up to emptiness in our life and camp there. I know that you don't willingly put up a tent in the valley of the shadow of death. But listen, before God can get you to lie down in green pastures, he's got to get you to step into a field. 
and it's a field of uneasiness, uncertainty, and it is a field that looks barren in your eyes. Let me remind you of an Old Testament story. Because I said barren fields bring abundant life. There was this man named Elijah, and he prayed that for three and a half years there would be a drought upon the earth. And they had this little duel on the mountain with some bad guys. And he prayed, and the fire came down, and they killed the bad guys. And at the end of that, Elijah goes to King Ahab, and he says, You better get yourself something to eat. You better get yourself something to drink. I don't know about you, but when I eat and I drink, I am the happiest especially if I do it around good people. So if I'm eating with you and I'm drinking with you and we're fellowshipping, fellowshipping, I call that a party. And so Elijah looked at King Ahab in the middle of a drought and he says, go throw yourself a party. Have a good old time because this barren field is about to bring abundant life. Elijah said, I hear the thunder. I see the lightning. There is rain coming down and that which was barren is about to bring abundance in your life. Listen, if you're on the edge of a barren field today and you don't know which way to turn, look up because rain is getting ready to come. There is cloud. You should be shouting today. There are clouds in the forecast and the heavens are going to open their windows upon you because at the end of barren fields abundant life breaks out Amen. Elijah said you better get down here you better step into this field you better head on home because abundant life is on the way number two barren fields don't only bring abundant life barren fields ignite new passion the reason that we lose our contentment is because we lose our passion when we lose our passion, we lose our desire. When you lose your desire, you lose the will to get things done. And when we lose our will, we start doing things out of habit, not because we're passionate about it. You can relate that to any relationship that you've ever been in. When you first meet that person, there is passion. And after a week's time, the passion dies, and now it's habit. Now, it takes longer than a week, hopefully. <laughs> If it only took a week, you're the wrong person. It takes at least a month. Passion. And, and there are things, there are things in your life right now that you used to do out of a passion for it, but now you just do it because it's happened. And, and you're looking at a bare field, and you're, you're thinking, well, i got to step into it because, you know, it's, it's a habit. And there are things maybe in your church life that you do because it's a habit. And habits are good, especially when they're good habits. But we can't do service to the kingdom if we're doing things out of habit and not out of passion. Because eventually the habit will get old and you will start to resent that what you are doing. Listen, you, you can't serve Grace for a New Church simply because it's habit. Will there be times that you've got to fight through it out of habit? Absolutely. You can't serve your God out of habit. Amen. Do you got to fight through it because it's a habit? Absolutely. There will be times like that. But eventually, God has to ignite a new passion within you. Because if he doesn't light a new passion, you're going to burn out real quick. And your habit's going to turn to a bad habit. And you're going to stop doing that which God's called you to do. Because now it's not your passion, it's your habit. Can I be honest with you? Some Sundays I stand up here and I got to preach because it's habit. Absolutely. I fight it just like you. If I don't show up here, you know, some of you might rejoice, but some of you will be upset. <laughs> and the one thing that I, I pray to God, God, you've got to keep the passion. Amen. If I lose my passion, we're gonna, we're, we're, I'm in trouble. And, and I look across and I see so many Christians who have walked through barren fields and the barren fields have stopped their passion and that's not that what they were intended to do. Sometimes God has to show you emptiness to show you how to fill you. He can't fill your vessel up if it's filled with things of the world. You can't pick up the treasure of the kingdom of God if your hands are filled for what the world has to offer. And many times to ignite your passion, he's got to empty you of something that is a fake passion. The man wanted the treasure that he found in the field. And what did the man have to do? He had to go home and sell everything. He had to empty his house or he wasn't getting the treasure. 
And it says that in his excitement, he walked through a barren time of life. And there was a seed of excitement that was planted. But right now, some of you may be fighting that same thing in your life. You're, you're thinking that there's this emptiness and you're, you're just doing things out of habit. And now you've got this barren field in front of you and you've missed the passion that you once had. If God has led you to a barren field, step into it because there's a seed of passion that's getting ready to grow. And when your passion begins to ignite again, you can start doing service for the kingdom like you're supposed to. Listen, I serve a God who can breathe life up on that which was dead. I serve a God whose breath can fan the smallest flame. I serve a God who is a consuming fire, who can ignite passion in our lives. Again, listen, if we were passionate about the kingdom the way we should be passionate about the kingdom, it would take a lot more than a Dunkin' Donuts drive through line to steal our joy. God, ignite the passion within us again. I'm to the edge of barren field, Joe. Yeah, but there's passion on the other side getting ready to explode. How do you know that? Because when the man found the treasure that he wasn't even looking for in his excitement. My, my desire, listen, I've heard it over and over. Some of you, some of you were drawn to this church and your testimony was you, you were, you were, you were dry. You, you were, you were burned out. You were tired. You were spiritually dying. You are lacking something. And your testimony has been through the grace of God. Grace renewed has ignited a passion. Amen. And make sure I understand. I want to tell you something because I want to make sure that you understand this. I, I didn't say the worship team ignited a passion. I didn't say the welcome table. I didn't say the kids leaders. I didn't say our missions trip. I didn't say our financial gains. I didn't say Joel Silver, the preacher, ignited your passion. I said by the grace of of God, the breath of God blew over top of a coal, and that ember that you had, God put it back on fire again. If there's ever a prayer that you need to pray, not only for yourself, but our church and your preacher and everybody involved in everything that takes place, God, don't let us lose our passion. Because as long as there's life, when they walk through the doors, they'll keep coming back. Amen. But you got to keep your passion. And sometimes as individuals and sometimes as an entire church body, God's going to get us to a barren field and say, you've got to step into it and trust Amen. me that there's passion on the other side. Amen. Why don't we have a building? <laughs> because we're on the edge of a barren field still. Don't you turn around and run from it. We'll step into it. And when we find where we're supposed to go, we'll, in our excitement, we'll sell off all our houses and buy the... Amen. Amen. I know what amens are that way. We all just live together and we'll just hate each other by day one. In, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, uh, John writes to a church in Ephesus. He said, you're doing a lot of good things. You're, you're, you're serving, but it's out of habit. You're attending, but it's a ritual. You're giving, but it's a chore. He said, I got one thing against you. You've lost your passion, your first love. You've lost it. I'd rather God give us a barren field in front of us and say step into it to create passion than to always just give, 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 give. And then at the end of the day, he looks at us and said, I gave, 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 gave. But because of my continual giving, you lost your passion. You know, when you're the most passionate, you're the most passionate when you've went without for a while. And then all of a sudden, God has supplied why do you think it says it's harder for a rich man? Praise God, we're all getting in. It's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than it is a camel through the eye of a needle because he doesn't really have anything to be passionate about. He's got it all. 
God says, sometimes I've got to allow you to see an empty, barren field that when you find the kingdom that is like a treasure, the passion will be ignited with you and you will once again do service for the kingdom, not out of habit, but of, out of love for a father that sits on the throne. Amen. Barren, barren fields, barren Amen. fields church ignites new passions. And so in your life right now, if you're on the edge of a barren field, there is a treasure in the middle of it to ignite a passion in your life. Amen. Step into that field. Amen. Last but not least, number three. Barren fields produce decisions. Barren fields produce decisions. When the man found the treasure, I always wondered, I told you this, why did he hide it again? He should have put it in his pocket and went home. But it says he had to hide it again. So apparently the treasure that he found, and don't miss this one, the treasure that he found, what's the treasure represent? Come on, it says it. Kingdom of God. Come on, pay attention. The treasure <laughs> represents the kingdom of God. But he had to hide that again. Apparently the treasure did not allow him to return to the place that he was coming from. Apparently he, he couldn't take the treasure with him. Apparently the treasure was too big. Apparently the treasure said that you've got to buy the surrounding territory. Apparently the treasure told the man that if you want to experience this, you can't live in the same spot that you were once living. You've got to move right here and live in this territory. Apparently the treasure said you can't return to your own life. Apparently the treasure said I'm too good to go back to the pig pen. Apparently the treasure said you ain't taking me to that place. Apparently it was the treasure that drew the man out of a previous life and put him back on a firm foundation. Apparently the treasure was worthy to give up everything that that man was experiencing. Amen. And with that treasure, he wanted to grab hold of it, but before he could grab hold of it, he had to let go of some things at home. Before he could fully experience it, it says he had to sell off everything that he had. And he had to buy the entire field to gain the treasure. Because when you decide, see, all, all of you have at, at bits and pieces. You, you've seen the, the kingdom of God. You, you've seen what God has to offer you. All of you have at different times in your life. And all of us, every single one of us, every person under the sound of my voice right now, everyone then struggles whether or not I can sell off everything that I currently enjoy to dive 100% all in to get the full benefits of the kingdom. I'm okay with the kingdom of God on a Sunday morning from 10 to 11, 19. I'm okay with the kingdom of God on a Wednesday night. I'm okay with that. But on a Saturday night, I'm not okay with the treasure showing up. I'm not okay on a Friday night having the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is changing the way I act. I'm okay with the kingdom of God when I'm in church around church people, but I'm not okay with the kingdom of God saying I can't hang out with the same crew anymore. And we go back and forth and back and forth and we wonder why there's not a true revival within us. It's because we're not willing to sell off some things that God said have absolutely no value in your life. They're dragging you down. Because when you decide to commit to the kingdom, there is extra territory that comes with it. There is a cost. Amen. There's a cost to the treasure. There, there, there is excess that you have to be willing to say, yeah, I'm all in. See, the Bible says, he gives another parable. The Bible says that no one begins to build a project until they do what? They count the cost. No one starts building a house unless you find out if you got enough money in the budget. Because if you do that, before long, you'll have to claim bankruptcy. No, no one starts building a house that they can't afford. 
No one starts a building project before they count the cost. They have to make sure they have the funds to finish it. And when you decide that you're going to pick up the treasure in the kingdom, you got, you got to be willing. Because the treasure comes with a cost. Jesus gave a prime example. The Bible says that when Jesus looked at the cross, he despised it. When Jesus looked at the Father in the garden, he prayed to him, let me walk away from what is before me. If, this, if you can pass this cup from me or take it from me, please do it. But when he looked at the cross, that which was despised, that which would be humiliating, that which would be an anguish and pain that no one could, when he looked at what was before him, he hated the cross. But he saw a glory, it says, on the other side that he was willing to walk to the cross and bear that cross because he was willing to pay that cost because he saw the opportunity and the ability to walk out of an empty grave. Listen, church, I know that sometimes there is a, a cost to the kingdom of heaven, but there is a glory, and my Bible says that your father has things prepared for you that your mind cannot comprehend words cannot describe your eyes have never seen there is a glory that outweighs the few little costs that come about because you call yourself a Christian the cost is well worth the reward but it makes decisions it makes decisions and some of you today in life God's put you before a barren field and he said okay are you willing to step into that field and are you willing to go back home and say, yeah, I can't do that, 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 and that, and I'm giving up that, and I'm definitely, nope, not going over there. Are you willing to make some life changes? Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, he said, but you are to be perfect. We don't preach that very often. That's what he said, but you are to be perfect. You have to have a striving to be perfect. You have to have a mindset to be perfect. You have to have a will to be perfect. And you can't be perfect if you don't know barren fields bring life. You can't be, be perfect if you don't know that barren fields bring passion. But Joel, you're probably, right now you're saying, Joel, there's no way I am going to be perfect. Well, I'm glad that you have that mindset because then my Bible says that though you are striving and you are trying and you are working to be perfect, that there is a Savior who counted the cost, who's on the other side of the field, that when you fall short, he's willing to pick up the pieces and he's willing to put you back together and he's willing to make you new again. And he says, my grace and my mercy is sufficient for you so though we strive to be perfect and we make the decision to serve when I come up short I serve a God who's never lost a battle I serve a God who's never tasted defeat I serve a God who has saved me by his grace and his grace is enough for me that in my shortcomings and my weakness praise God he is made strong but if you're not willing to step into the field and at least give it a go, you're missing out on the benefits of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like a treasure that a man goes to the edge of a field and he discovered it. And in his excitement, he hit it again and he sold everything he owned because he knew that that which he just found could quench his thirst. For Jesus looked at the woman of the well and said, anyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but they that drink from the water that I will bring will never thirst again. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is asking his Christ he is asking his children to go ahead and step foot in that barrenness that you call life and the emptiness that you're struggling in and the discontentment that you're dealing with. He's asking you to step 
foot into that field that you're on the edge of because he's got abundant life coming your way. He wants to ignite a new passion in your life and he wants you to make the decision once and for all to fully count the cost and to grab hold of the kingdom in its entirety. Step into the field today. Thank you.